Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech uh, on a given Thursday morning. It's a noon, a noon show here. It's history is here to help. You know, as time goes by, I appreciate this show and its progenitor, uh, Peter Hoffenberg, all the more. Because we, we live in a world where history is somehow disconnected, and it's our job on this show to connect it all back again to put us uh, in the context of a dynamic history, a, a long-term history, a history that moves into the future. Um, so today we're going to talk to Charlene Nakamoto Levine, and we're going to talk about um, a very interesting topic. We're talking about monuments, um, and it's uh, the proper memorials and monuments for all. Uh, and the, for all is important, and proper is important. <laughs> so let's start, Peter, with a hello. Um, and would you please introduce Charlene? My pleasure. Aloha, everyone. Uh, Professor Levine. Uh, a personal friend, but we won't allow that to distort our conversation by any means at all. Uh, she holds a PhD from uh, UC Santa Barbara, uh, teaches at Honolulu Community College, which includes teaching uh, at external campuses. So she has a real hands-on view of our college students and those who are, are taking courses even part-time. Original scholarship was very importantly uh, about the plantation societies here, particularly late 19th, early 20th century. Uh, she does very important work in oral history, uh, ethnic studies, social history, and today uh, she's going to talk to us about, um, I think it's fair to say, a new curriculum for her, which is to, along with her students, explore this current debate about monuments and memorials. So I'm looking forward to her discussing American, in particular in Hawaiian memorials, and perhaps I can provide some complementary information about this debate in Europe, because it's not reserved for the United oh, States that's by any means. Yeah any means at all. So Charlene, thank you for joining us. And let me turn it over to you and Jake. Yeah, Charlene, I was thinking about this show, you know, and what I thought about was all those Confederate holy people and statues in the South. Um, and I said to myself, you know, at the time they went to the trouble of designing, you know, constructing, erecting, and uh, paying homage to those statues, that was what the public at the time wanted. Um, and when we pull them down, when we criticize them now, um, query, are we respecting the history of the moment in which they were created? We're rewriting history through the lens of how we feel about things now, aren't we? Well, one of the things that people often aren't aware of is that the Confederate statues didn't go up, you know, right after the Civil War. It was during the Jim Crow era, the like late 1890s, early 1900s, when the children of the Confederacy, uh, of the Confederate leaders, wanted their um, fathers to be remembered and revered in a way. And they wanted to rewrite history. So it wasn't really, you know, and that's an interesting it, point. Yeah. But, but but my, it's yeah. not so much that we rewriting it today, but they were engaged in rewriting yes. it then. And the so, only thing I would add is there, there are two spikes in the building of what we consider Confederate memorials. Uh, Jolene's absolutely right that the late 1890s, but there's also a spike in the 1920s, which coincided with America's Exclusionary Immigration Act and a violent renaissance of. Uh, the KKK, let's just be blunt. Mm -hmm. uh, so these, the second generation of these monuments, if you talk about what the public wanted, it's a very a reserved small group of the public. Right, uh, they were trying to get out of this little interchange <laughs> yeah. is that yeah. these statues and monuments, you know, are, can be, and maybe they should be a reflection of how people feel at the time. And I'm, I'm asking you this question, Charlie, it's okay. To pull them down when people really have found that they're not, not appropriate? So that's a question that um, I ask my students to think about, and this is something that's being debated, is whether, like, um, how should we decide the fate of memorials and monuments? Should it just be by allowing mob rule to di dictate what comes goes down? Or should there be a process that is followed to try to decide this, you know, that that does involve the public. 
So, you know, some people, even some people who are really opposed to the Confederate statues, some of them also think that it's important to have a process to take public input because otherwise, you know, we could remove the Confederate statues and then put up something that you think is more appropriate, but some other mob might come along and take yours down. So your group statue down. So yeah. <laughs> it, well, what, kind of, what kind of process are you talking about? I mean, do we, do we need an act of Congress to put them up or take them down? By the way, Congress isn't enacting anything now, so that would be a big problem. Um, but <laughs> how, how much, how much uh, buy-in from the government do we need? How wide does this conversation have to be to put up a statue or take it down? Well, you want to answer that, Charlene, or you want me to jump in? Go ahead, Peter. Say something. Okay, so with that, I mean, I think probably if you Google, the most significant statue is the one to Robert E. Lee. I think that's the one that's gotten the most attention. And its removal, its final removal, is a pretty good exercise to answer your question. Uh, it ran through, since it is a state and local statute, it's not a federal statute, it ran through local and state governments. And so there were hearings on both sides. And the way representative democracy is supposed to work, I, I guess that was I'm glad you said that. Some people, in, in some that, states, you have a big problem. Right, that's the that. result. Okay, I mean, let me, because there are two levels here. There's a local and a federal, and they're not the same. So local, uh, if the property and the statue is within a municipality or within a state, it's considered state, because some municipal lands are considered state lands, then the process is a, is a very well-known legal process. There's a petition goes before the board, as it did with the Robert E. Lee statue. The board hears from both sides, and the board decided the board, the duly elected representatives. So in other words, if, if people are going to complain now about the Robert E. Lee statue being taken down, they're essentially the same people on January 6th who can't live with representative government. OK, that's the local state area. But there, to answer your question about Congress, actually, Congress did do something, and President Trump vetoed it. The last defense authorization bill that Congress passed included the renaming of all military bases, like Fort Bragg, which are named after Confederate officers. Congress voted for that. The president vetoed it. So there's an example where Congress. Okay, what that tells us, Charlene, is that it's political. And that, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's really not a matter of representative government, it's a matter of political. Uh, Congress. Um, Trump, uh, some states this way, some states that way. And so what you get is putting them up as political and taking them down as political. And that enters into the, the process, doesn't it? But it's not just the politicians that are deciding because politicians do answer to the people. So if the people, if, if we can see that image again um, that was shown earlier of the Robert E. Lee statue being put down, I mean, you can see that this, this monument was graffitied and you know people were expressing their feelings about that and um, in the state of Virginia um, Governor Ralph Northam he himself uh, vowed to um, uh, support racial justice especially after the incident where he was found to have um, a yearbook photo where he doesn't say which person he was on his yearbook page. Either he's the KKK person, you know, dressed up in the white outfit, or he's the person, the white person in blackface. He was either one of those two people. And um, because of all the outcry over that, he vowed to support racial justice and he actually um, supported the removal of the Robert E. Lee statue. Um, yeah. So, what, what happens when uh, you have, a, say, a movement like Black Lives Matter? And they're offended by some of these statues and and they're having a, a, a protest demonstration walking down the street together and they say gee let's let's do graffiti on the statue or worse let's pull it all down you don't have any governmental imprimatur on that um they just decide that it doesn't fit for them and they take matters into their own hands where does that fit in this continuum they do risk though um I mean, states have laws against doing that. So they do risk getting arrested for those things. I mean, defacing statues isn't 
new. Um, there are, um, uh, there's a burial site in California for um, Father Junipero Cerro, who started the mission system. And his um, grave site, they had red paint thrown on it because people, uh, you know, uh, because of the way the mission system uh, really um, led to enslavement of Native people. A lot of people died in the missions. So, so that's why those protests happened. But when, when the defacement happened, the news said, oh, that these people, if, if, if we find out who they are, they can be arrested. Yeah, so. but they aren't, though. Um, and uh, I mean, I haven't heard of any. And the other thing I wanted to mention is, um, it seems to me there has been a, a dynamic increase in the amount of defacing that has gone on over recent years, where people feel, regardless of the law that might punish them for it, people feel that they should deface this statue because it's not consistent with their, their, their belief or their the group belief. Uh, here, there's another example. Right. Uh, the and statue I think becomes it, a political icon. Right. If, if the question is, why is it happening now? I mean, with social media and, um, you know, with with the rise of Black Lives Matter, using social media to protest, um, like the death of George Floyd, the killing of George Floyd, or the Native American activism that's also, you know, um, like around the Dakota pipeline, you know, all these, it's really with the rise of social media, I think that um, people are more aware of these issues. Um, during the pandemic, when people went out to protest George Floyd, I mean, they're outside in the public and they're right next to like Robert E. Lee statues and other kinds of things and people are, and that's the context in which people were starting to um, protest the memorials. Because the memorials are standing, you know, they're symbols of colonialism and of slavery. You know, the roots of uh, racism. You know, I know what racism. a statue is, Shirley. I yeah. know what a statue is. That's yeah. that's easy. Um, but what is a memorial? Well, I mean, I, I guess you could call so a, a monument or a memorial can take a lot of different forms. So it could be a statue. It could be an obelisk. It could be a mural on a wall. I mean, there's one of President Obama on Ward Avenue, right? Um, it, it could take, I also consider um, monuments or memorials to be um, when we name things after people to remember them. So we have schools in Hawaii, such as McKinley High School, right? That honors a president that supported um, annexation of Hawaii. Um, yeah. Well, that, you know, it's interesting because um, I don't know uh, uh, how we rate McKinley. Let's let's assume for a moment that uh, he was involved in Harvey Weinstein kind of things um, back there in the 19th century. Only we're not aware. We don't know. We haven't studied McKinley. At the time, it seemed like a good idea because he was the president and he had done some good things. I think for Hawaii, among other things. Um, but you know, maybe he did some other things that. You know, through the evaluation you might make today, or you know, not not terrific, um, but we don't know. Uh, we, we, the public is not aware, and so I'm wondering how many statues, how many memorials get by, because they have not become political icons, because they're there, and you know, we we just don't focus on what their what their meaning is historically. Are we ninety eight percent? <laughs> okay. But in, in one analogy we can draw, because we've talked about it before, is, uh, look, we have a, a constitution which gets amended, or should be amended, and that means that a rethinking of what was originally written down and asking whether that is still relevant today. Now, we, most Americans are willing to do that. A monument and a memorial is very similar. A monument and a memorial built in 1920 and understood why and how it was built and for what meaning in 1920. And that meaning is now abhorrent. And the monument goes, the memorial goes. I, I don't see uh, part of the issue is um, what to do with them. Fair enough. So in Britain, with independence in 1947, 
Indian national government took all the monuments and memorials that were in public to the Raj and put them in one open museum. And if you want to go there and pelt the statues, you're welcome to. If you want to go there and worship them, you're welcome to. But it's isolated, not public life. The problem is, I mean, you say that there is a, an increase in defacing. Well, that ignores the long history of the people who are now complaining who defaced Native American memorials and African American memorials and monuments, and nobody seemed to care. Um, so the people who are kvetching about it are from a long line of not only building unacceptable monuments, but destroying these sacred areas and memorials to the people who now don't like them there. So this is a dynamic from the get-go. And everybody who's complaining about pulling down Robert E. Lee ought to take a look at the engravings of the colonists who were rebels and terrorists and tore down the statue of George III. Now, Actually, you're making me think of, Peter, how um, when I teach about um, the Americas, um, how to my students early American history, like pre-colonial, that I explained that when when like the Spaniards came in, they actually literally built over the religious sites sure. of native peoples, and they would put a church or a um, right on top. Right now, that comes from um, <laughs> yeah. That comes from a bit of a Catholic tradition, which is to integrate Catholicism and local quote unquote paganism. So, is which is not to excuse what they're doing, but yeah. they did it without any thought. Right, which is not to excuse it. That was just their natural world. And I think, Jay, part of the problem here is um, are we going to be historians and are we going to respect the past? Or are we going to exploit the past for our own contemporary needs? And there is really what is the need to have the Robert E. Lee statue? Okay, I mean, some people really liked him. The end of the Civil War, he was too bad. There's some gentleman. people. Like he surrendered his. Uh, he did good work in the field. If you if you like war, uh, and he surrendered no, no, his fact, sword. No. See, in fact, that's all wrong. He was actually a poor commander, a poor commander. I mean, this is part. No, but see, this is part of what the problem with the statue is. Okay, it's call it misunderstanding. It's yeah. not a misunderstanding. The South lost the war. The South lost the war. Um, how many great commanders? Napoleon lost Waterloo. That makes him not a great commander. Napoleon lost Russia. Napoleon lost Haiti. Napoleon lost Egypt. Okay, he's not a great commander. Robert E. Lee was not a great Peter, commander. Peter, if we pull the statue down of every commander who lost the war, we'd be busy all day. Uh, no, we'd be, we'd, be busy, we'd be busy pulling down statues of people who are misunderstood as great commanders, not winners or losers. There are plenty of statues to losers. Okay, it's not winning or losing. It's are you erected? Because you see what happens with Robert E. Lee. He's a great commander. It is a lost cause. We should have won the war. Why didn't we win the war? Oh, because the Union freed slaves and used slaves as soldiers. We've talked about this before on the show. One of the the great tragedies in modern history is countries uh, unwilling to accept defeat and blaming somebody else. Right? Plant, France blames Dreyfus, 1871. Hitler and the Nazis. Well, should should we take uh, Robert, Lee, Robert E. Lee out of the uh, history books? No, he should be understood as for what. What he was. He was a What's slave. The only I, I want to add something. <laughs> yeah, please just jump in. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. So when we're thinking about, well, who is who is memorialized and actually what stories we're not hearing, um, you know, there's actually most statues are of men. And even men that are I mean, you I mean, there are so many men who have statues. <laughs> <laughs> and you know we could statues. we could and we could argue like Peter is saying that some of them don't deserve their statues. But um, if we can see slide um, ten of the image ten um, put up, um, this is a memorial that, that was created by Sharon Hayes in Philadelphia. And what she says is that there's far few memorials for women and women leaders. So. Out of the hundreds of sculptures in Philadelphia, only two are dedicated to women. Right. Um, and 
they, they're at least half the population, right? <laughs> they have been half, half the population. So in her sculpture, she aimed to draw attention to this. So she recreated the bases of nine memorials that celebrate men. And on these bases, she wrote the names of women who have contributed greatly to Philadelphia. And, um, you know, I would argue that in Hawaii, um, well, especially re relating to war and um, memorials of war and military service, there, women are far underrepresented. So um, if you look at slide eight, we have a new statue at Schofield that was started, that was established in 2016. So this is, it's called the Female Combat Soldier, and it's a tribute to all women warriors who have served in the US past and present. And this is the fifth statue in the United by Sacrifice Memorial. So when I was curious about whether women soldiers in Hawaii had any kind of, you know, memorial, that, that's that's one I found recently. All right, that opens up a whole other can of work. <laughs> so let me let me first respond to Jay. That okay. If, if you want to have a monument to Robert E. Lee, at least have a monument to Robert E. Lee, which is honest about who Robert E. Lee was. The, uh, monuments cannot helpfully contribute to distorting myths. If they do that, then they really must, they must go. Now, Charlene, I'm gonna say uh, what Jay has heard me say every two weeks. Um, there really should be no war memorial to monuments. That in and of itself is a problem. Any war memorial or any war monument just increases militarism, whether it's a woman or not. The notion of Warfare and sacrifice and heroism are overly privileged in the world. Yes. So and they're you know, institutionalized was... through war memorials. So I ask my students every semester to share a memorial in their neighborhood community. Um, so one student did share Gandhi's statue, which is near Kapilani Park, which I wasn't mm -hmm. aware of. Right? right in front of the zoo. And yeah. there's also a um, peace park um, at the base of Diamond Head. So we do have some, right, but I think they're emotional. less, yeah, they're less well known than say the Arizona Memorial. But they're right? also <laughs> they're also not always known as peace memorial. So for example, oh. you go to Gandhi and you may or may not know, and that was actually funded privately. That wasn't built by the city. That had to be funded privately. If you if you look at the bottom oh, of the trees. Okay. okay. But the natatorium is of course a World War One memorial. Now Jay's gonna <laughs> sneer at me because I, I always I mean I, I think one of the great evils we have is militarism. Well and the idea know, of a mind of that memorial. point Peter you know mm -hmm. the reason a lot of these uh, I'm not advocating for these particular memorials but I'm trying to see them through the sure. people oh. through the eyes of the people who were there who uh, allowed them to happen or funded them or voted for them whatever it is that made that made the right. community and, elect and, them. And they were That's saying, we look, we lost a lot of people in the war. They okay. died. You know, I mean, for example, there's the Vietnam uh, right near the Capitol, you know what I mean? Sure. Richard Street, there's a Vietnam Memorial. And, uh, you know, that was done in relatively recent times. And that was very controversial because it, there, there were the two Vietnam Memorials, actually. There's a new one which includes women and the statues of women who okay. served in Vietnam. Well, the okay, next without to it getting is to gender. Um, you know, but, that's but, a memorial. But, no, but I'm going to ask your question. To, to ask your respect question because... the people who fell, to respect the people who from Hawaii who went, and I'm sure that you know this exists for the 442nd as well, mm -hmm. who who gave their lives for the cause. So a war memorial doesn't celebrate the war so much as the people who regrettably lost their lives in the war. It's not the same thing, and um, uh, I, okay, I don't I know would... how you. I don't know how you get through that and have all these people who died and, and not pay homage with a memorial of some kind. Charlene? I, well, I guess, you know, I was thinking about my, how do I as a historian feel about memorials and monuments? And honestly, I'm not really comfortable with them because I feel like they give us a very narrow piece of history it's very easy to oversimplify and maybe 
it's easy for the public to want to just celebrate people they think are heroes. And it's much harder to look at people in, maybe it's harder to even face the what, what you consider the villains of society. And maybe I'm just more comfortable with books. <laughs> and I, maybe there shouldn't be so many, many memorials. But um, I have a slide that, um, so if, if we could see slide 13 talking about Vietnam, there's something called a counter memorial. And it's a memorial that's designed not to impose any meaning on the viewer. So you, so you can see it just has all the names of all the veterans, I guess, who um, I, I guess were lost in this war. And um, it, you can see people's reflection. So the viewer, sees themselves reflected back from this. So this is an, a, another type of memorial. And one of my question about it is, do you think it's effective or not? Or what well, I, I've, studied, I've studied that memorial a lot. I mean, I can tell you about the history uh -huh. of it. And the history of that memorial reveals in good part why there are problems with war memorials, with all due respect to Jay. It's designed by Maya Lin, who is an architecture student. So first of all, there were attacks on her for being an Asian woman. An Asian woman shouldn't be doing all right. And that's a very revealing comment, right? Like, do you think racist, the Robert, do you think the Robert Lee statue? Attacks. No, well, wait, right, right. But that's what part of the war was, though. Part of the war was whites in Australia and America fighting Asians. That's one of the realities of that war. OK. Um, would you do you think the Virginia folks in 1920 asked a black man to carve the Robert E. Lee statue? Do you think if a black man had presented? So that originally tells you that the building of a statue or the building memorial, regardless, is already a political and divisive issue from the get go. Then she was accused of scarring the landscape, meaning that that monument was not an appropriate architectural form. That the architectural form should be what most of them are, hero worship. All right. Then there were discussions about the fact that you do see yourself. So veterans, some veterans, now that's mellowed out, but some veterans resented that, thinking of Henry V. We are a band of brothers, and only we veterans really know the suffering, and only we veterans really know what it means to die in war. Uh, you know the TV show Band of Brothers. That's taken from Henry V, Shakespeare's uh, speech before uh, the Battle of Agincourt. So this is a really good example. I'm glad Charlene brought it up. What I can say, because I'm not entirely negative, is that now it is accepted. And now veterans and families go, and what they do is they literally, which you're not accustomed to with other statues, is the idea of, of touching it. You touch the name you know. So I reach out and I touch Sarah Smith Nurse, I, and I can make a connection. Okay, so what Maya Lin is doing is saying, let's make the connection a humanist and humanitarian connection. Let's not make the connection based on race. Let's not make the connection based upon the fact that the war was divisive. Okay, now that's a very different approach. Yes, it is. And I want to I want to point out and ask Charlene or she's followed this. You know, when we see Robert Robert E. Lee and, and actually statues up to that point and beyond, uh, they're you know they're people on horses or in idyllic circumstances, uh, and they're they're they try to represent the reality of the individual. Uh, maybe they were mm -hmm. even. Po I, 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 don't, I don't think they try to represent the reality. Yeah. Right? I mean, they're uh, idealized. Uh, 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 well, they they are individuals uh, who are represented in the in the material, whatever it is, bronze or mm -hmm. marble or what have you. But now we look we look at the Vietnam uh, memorial and some of these other uh, memorials and statues, and we see that there's there's art there, there's a philosophical analysis there, there's an attempt to to see it in broader terms. To make a statement beyond uh, hero worship, as Peter calls it, um, and these are really artistic um, and architectural projects uh, that are meant to make a statement on into the future. 
they are they are meant to tell a story to future generations. And this story is more complex than Robert Lee on a horse. Am I right? The way this is going, it's changing. There is a dynamic in all of these statues and memorials that are being built now today. Am I right? <laughs> yes or no? <laughs> So if you're interested in looking at new monuments that have been publicly vetted and made with public input, you can go to Monument Lab's website, which was started by two University of Pennsylvania professors who were interested in this topic. And, um, you know, in going back, I know our time's almost up, but um, going back to the McKinley statue, you know, in Hawaii, we don't have people as of yet that I know of tearing statues down. However, there is pushback against the colonialist history of Hawaii, writing of, you know, the colonialist perspective on Hawaii history and um, an effort to, um, to remember and to revive some of the Hawaiian monuments that were suppressed by missionaries. So one example, if we can go to slide 12, um, this is an animated uh, version of the monument. But, um, th and so this animation is gonna be coming out soon, but um, it, this, this one um, remembers and recognizes the healer stones of Kapai Mahu, and which translates to the row of Mahu. So those four stones stand for four Mahu, right? Um, dual male and female spirited people. Um, but, and they were said to have brought the healing arts from Tahiti to Hawaii. Okay, so this is not really known probably except maybe around some people who are deep into native hawaiian history and culture um but and also even in like i said naming is another way to memorialize things and um a lot of you have heard of coco head right but coco head has another name that hawaiians that hawaiians used prior to the missionaries Protestant missionaries calling it Coco Head. So they used to call it, I don't know if I'm saying this correctly, but Cohele Pelepe. And that means the fringed vulva. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but it was probably too sexual for the missionaries, this is, right? This is, a, this is a family show. <laughs> show, right. And I, I'm blushing. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, if there's few memorials to women, there's even fewer re relating to LGBTQ issues and sexuality um, in Hawaii and probably in the United States in general. So. Well, it, it seems to me, <laughs> as I said before, this is a reflection of the political environment. And we have a political environment where people feel free and oh, are yeah. free to um, disagree about things. And it seems to me that uh, that makes it more difficult to select a, a statue where everyone agrees this statue should be up there. Um, and uh, likewise, I think that the architectural community, the art community should have a say. They should be involved in every statue because it, it's, part of our, um, it's part of our quality of life. It's part of our, uh, our outdoor experience, our, community experience in public places. <laughs> it's a statement of the, it defines our public places. So we have to be careful uh, that it represents how the public uh, feels about the issue, the person, um, and, and, and how the public will enjoy <laughs> the issue and the person in, embodied in that statue or memorial going forward. So this is uh, actually, I see this as very dynamic. I see it as a good thing that you're studying this um, and teaching about it and collecting information about it because um, it's, it's a great way for the community. Listen to this as a conclusion. It's a great way for the community to come together on, on its true values. 
because we, you know this is a statement of the value values adopted by that community. They'd be different than the next community, um, but I, we have. I think we have learned um, over the past few years that it's it's incumbent on us to try to do that. Um, so your thoughts, Charlene, your your last thoughts because we're running out of time. I, I usually wrap up with my students and I ask them, what kind of memorials do you think future generations are gonna make about us? And what kind of memorial do you want, You know, how do you wanna be remembered? Whether it's on your tombstone, if you have one, or <laughs> you know, most people are cremated nowadays. You know, but whatever it is, what words do you want attributed to you, or what sayings attributed to you? So, pretty so yeah, you, you can design your own statue, then you got to see <laughs> if anybody will put up the money for it, <laughs> <laughs> or deface it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Peter, it's your turn to. Uh, okay. give us a thank you very much uh, a Charlene. profound summary of what we've been talking about well, and what Charlene that. has been delivering today okay. and what, what you've been delivering today all right well first of all Charlene thank you very much um not just for the comments but I think the very helpful example because when we talk about monuments and memorials we can get very abstract so having those concrete uh images I will not be profound I never am but let me uh end in the Talmudic tradition of ending with questions I think that's more more helpful. And I think the conversation uh, has raised at least two very profound questions, uh, which is what, what is the purpose of a memorial or a monument? And is that purpose when it was originally built uh, relevant to a society that has changed? Um, and that is a difference between a mythological continuous sense of the past and the sense of the past which in a democracy is dynamic and changing. And so I will apologize for being repetitive, but I think there's an analogy with the Constitution. And most people agree the Constitution, while founded by uh, probably mostly dead white men now, um, with a particular interest, uh, they even recognize the need to change. Okay. Uh, secondly, I would sense, uh, and I think Jay, you make a very important point. A part of a democracy is negotiating what public interest is. And I like your phrase, the public space, but what the public space really is, is what is the common good? What is the public interest? And I think we might rethink as a society, a 21st century society, uh, why we need monuments or memorials in public spaces. What are they telling us about the public? And you and I can go on and on in this life and the afterlife, but you are never going to convince me uh, that there is a benign role to a war memorial. You're um, not gonna, a I... benign role to a war memorial. A war memorial in hey, the public. Peter, Peter, you've made that point, and uh, I, but I heard Charlene um, just now, and she might want to add to that. What, okay. what do you think about that, Charlene? Um, I just want to add that although we haven't had people tearing down memorials in Hawaii, we have had memorials renamed or changed. So if we could just show slide seven. This is um, Central Intermediate School, which it's recently been announced, I think just this past month, that it's going to be um, renamed after Princess Ruth Kaili Kolani. And she, Princess Ruth um, owned the property on which the campus sits, and she left, left most of her property to Bernice Pawahi, who's a uh, Whose, whose estate started the um, Bishop Museum and Mayamea Schools. But um, right. back in the day when- the land of Icondo. yes. Right, but back in the day when the school was, um, it, it was originally named after her, but people at the time said it was too hard to say her name. So they switched it to <laughs> Central Intermediate. But in this new context in which people are, um, with a revival of Hawaii, Native Hawaiian language, right, and history, um, the name has being restored now. And currently this past year, um, there was a, peti a, a petition to um, take McKinley's statue down and to rename the high school, but that bill uh, died in the legislature. But um, that is an ongoing issue with that school. Uh, two quick non-profound points, but might be interesting to your viewers. 
Now, the idea of the counter memorial or counter reminding started of all places in Germany, where there was a physical monument above ground, but it was lined with a soft material that you could write your comments about World War II and the Holocaust. And slowly but surely, that monument sank into the ground. So the idea was, okay, you want to express yourself, express yourself. But that expression is not cemented into a physical monument. So that's the notion of a counter monument or a counter memorial. And that exists um, in a, a, it's a relatively small German town. Secondly, um, if your viewers can stand 15 more minutes of video, I want to say it's very slowly so folks are interested. There is really a very informative, balanced video produced by the Museum of, of Natural History in New York on the Upper West Side over the debate about the Teddy Roosevelt Monument Memorial. And those of you who have the good pleasure of going to Zabar's and then moving up the road to the, memorial, the museum will note that, as you say, Jay, Teddy Roosevelt is on horseback. It's a long tradition, right, from the ancient Greeks and Romans through the Baroque. And that's not an unintended comment, right? A great leader controls a horse like a great leader controls men and women. On each side of Roosevelt, one is a statue of the representative Native American, and one is a statue of the representative African. So I'll leave everybody with the question, what should the museum do about that statue? Including the option of doing nothing, but the raising of the question. And if you Google, it's an excellent, especially for students, superb brief uh, video, which talks about what to do with that controversial statue of more than just an environmentalist. Teddy Roosevelt was much more than just an environmentalist. Okay, so thank you very much. I know we're out of time. Thank you, thank Charlene. You, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Thank Charlene. you, Jay. Very nice oh. discussion. Thank you for all your slides and photographs and references. It's been, it's been really interesting. Aloha. Aloha.